Buongiorno. Uh, as Fabio said, I'm going to talk about accessibility, something many people understand is important, but also find it difficult to know what they need to do to make accessibility work, where to find good answers, and sometimes to know what it is as developers and coders we need to think about. Accessibility has many different forms. It's part design, part usability, part experience, all about people, but underneath all that, there is a lot that comes from the code that we write. So at the very basic level, I want to try and explain something about accessibility mechanics, the relationship between the code that you write and the browser and the way someone like me, who is blind, uses the website or the web application that is the product of all that code. When you look at different controls in an operating system, like Windows or Linux or uh, Mac OS, iOS or Android, you'll find that there is certain accessibility information made available about different things. So for example, on screen there is a checkbox from somewhere on Windows 10, and it's a checkbox that lets you choose whether things are displayed in bold or not. If you look at it from an accessibility point of view, you'll find out that this control has a role of checkbox. That's its purpose, the thing it does. Uh, it has a state uh, that is focused, checked, and focusable, because you can focus on it with a keyboard. You can move to it when you use the tab key with the keyboard. And you can check it or uncheck it. And lastly, it has a label or a name, which is bold. It's the text that you can see on screen that tells you what the checkbox uh, will let you toggle on or off. But that's also the information that's made available to someone like myself who uses a screen reader. If you're not familiar with a screen reader, it's a piece of software that translates what most people see on screen into synthetic speech. And I'll show you some demonstrations as we go through this talk. The interesting thing about when you look at controls on the web is that if we use HTML to create the same kind of checkbox, one to toggle a bold state on or off, the accessibility information will be exactly the same. You'll find it has a role of checkbox, a label or an accessible name that's called bold, and that you can focus on it. It's currently focused, and it's currently checked. And the relationship between these two things, the way accessibility information is exposed in the operating system and the way it's exposed in browser content, is mapped by the W3C in a series of documents called Accessibility API Mappings Documents, AAM for short. And there is one for HTML, there's another for SVG, and a core document that just looks at some of the basic information. So a quick example now of what happens if you use a screen reader and uh, a page with just some basic headings, so the H tags, H1, H2. Tink heading level one. Proposed ARIA password role heading level two link. Using the ARIA application role heading level two link. So the screen reader just announces the heading as you see it on screen, but it also picks up the information from the HTML element and makes that information available to the user as well. So you'll have heard about a level one heading. That's when the H1 tag was used. An H2 represents a level two heading, and so on. And this works in lots of different ways. Pretty much all HTML elements convey this kind of information to screen readers. Uh, another example is when you use the HTML5 sectioning elements, like header, footer, uh, main, and a few others besides. Banner. Main region. Proposed ARIA password role article. Search region. Navigation region. So just by using nav, article, header, footer, and the main elements, the screen reader is able to tell the user about different areas of the page that are very easy to see when you look at the page, but not at all easy to see when you listen to it, of course. So there's a lot of good stuff that comes when you just use HTML in the most basic and normal way. 
There are a couple of exceptions, though. Sorry. Uh, the one thing that's important to uh, stress, though, sorry, is uh, how the um, browser conveys all this information to the user. When you put code into a browser, the browser creates the document object model, the DOM tree. You'll probably know about this. You're mostly coders and scripters yourselves. So you'll know it's a tree representation of all the objects and information contained within the page. What the browser also does is create an accessibility tree. It takes information from the DOM and creates a separate tree that contains all the information that's good for accessibility. So the information about role and name and state, just like we saw in the two examples at the start of this talk. And it's this information that assistive technologies like screen readers use and then convey information to the user. There's a couple of elements to be aware of, though. The div and span elements don't really have any strong accessibility information. They're what we call semantically neutral. Their roles don't really convey anything useful to someone because they're just neutral. We can use them for all sorts of reasons. We use them for styling hooks. We use them because we want to create elements and widgets and components that don't exist in HTML. But in themselves, Anything that you put inside a div or a span element has no accessibility information attached to it. So it just behaves like plain text. So I'm going to walk you through an example now of how useful HTML is by actually looking at recreating something incredibly simple uh, through different means. So we'll start off creating a link but we're going to start by using a span and the HTML5 data attribute. This might seem crazy. Jeremy made a very good point about pushing fragility down into the declarative layer and pushing that fragility down to a point where you make things much weaker where they really don't need to be. And this is very, very similar, but looking at accessibility more than JavaScript. The truth of the matter is, though, that many frameworks do exactly this. They don't use the right HTML element. They'll start from a span or a div and recreate it from scratch. To do that and make it accessible means you've got your work cut out for you. But first, let's have a look. So if we uh, put that uh, JavaScript and styling behind it, uh, this is pretty much how we'd expect this fake link to work in practice. Uh, you just move your mouse over it, you click on it, and it works pretty much as you would expect. If you wanted to use this link that's actually a span with a keyboard, this is what would happen. Nothing. Because a span is neutral. It's inert. You can't focus on a span with a keyboard. So if you can't focus on it, you can't use your tab key to move onto it. You can't interact with it, and that's pretty much the end of the story. This link is broken if you have to use a keyboard. So we need to do some stuff to fix that. We need to use the tab index attribute to make this span focusable with a keyboard. And we give the tab index attribute a value of 0. This will place this span into the natural keyboard sequence of the page. So wherever this piece of code appears in the DOM, that's where it'll appear in the keyboard sequence. So as a user tabs through the page, they'll tab onto this particular link just as though it were any other naturally focusable element in the page. And if you have to make something focusable when it isn't normally, tab index 0 is the best way to go about doing it. We also have to add some styling in, because accessibility isn't just about assistive technologies and screen reader users. Uh, it has a visual element, too. So whereas a link typically will have an on-hover style, we also need to make that same styling available when someone focuses on this link with a keyboard. So we can just duplicate the same styles, put some visible indication that focus or mouse cursor focus is on this link. So people know what they're about to click on or what they're about to activate. 
then we need to get into some of the mechanics. Uh, we can use an ARIA attribute, the role attribute, to tell the accessibility tree that this isn't a span. Let's pretend this is actually a link. So we use role equals link. And although this is still a span in the document object model, in the accessibility tree, it will now be reported as being a link. So a screen reader will think now that this is a link. But that will not make it behave like a link. All it does is tell an assistive technology like a screen reader that this is a link, uh, at least in the way it is announced to the user. So we need to add in some functionality. For the most part, this is pretty straightforward stuff. We add in the click functionality to support mouse users. But we also need to listen for the key down, because we need to make this keyboard accessible as well. And there's a good reason for listening for a key down. And I'll come to that in just a second. We need to add in, of course, functionality that will actually get this to behave like a link. So we use JavaScript to fetch the resource. In this case, it's the, uh, the website for my blog. And again, pretty straightforward. But we need to add in the keyboard functionality as well. And this is where listening for key down is useful, because we need to listen for the key code 13. It represents the enter key. When you use uh, an, a link, an A element in HTML, the browser will automatically make it focusable and will automatically make it usable with the Enter key. But because we're doing this from scratch, we have to do this with JavaScript. And that's why we listen for the Enter key and make sure that it, too, can activate the fetch resource functionality. So now what we have is something that started off as a span with no accessibility information, no keyboard focus or interaction. And we've added all those things in for ourselves. This is how it is with a screen reader now. Tab, tick UK link, tab. So someone tabbing onto the link can do that. The screen reader reads the link text and then tells the user that it's a link. And as a user, I then know that I can use the Enter key to activate it. But forgive me, that's an awful lot of work to do something remarkably basic. So the first rule of doing things to be accessible is use HTML in the way it was intended to if you can, because the browser will do a lot of the work for you. It will translate the information into the accessibility tree, and it's there for screen readers and assistive technologies to use. You'll get the keyboard focus. You'll get the keyboard interaction. So really, all you need to do is just add the basic functionality, and, uh, or at least an href attribute to tell the link where it should go, and a little bit of styling. And you've done the same job, but probably in about 80 or 90% less code and less hard work. So what about the times when you can't use an HTML element in the way that it was intended to? Quite often, we want to create things that don't exist in HTML, and that's good. It's one of the great things about the web is that we can create new things, we can push the boundaries, and we can have some fun, as well as solve some very practical problems. Like uh, this toggle tip idea, uh, developed by my friend and colleague at the Pastiello Group, Steve Faulkner. It was designed to help one of our clients who had very complicated forms that they needed their users to complete. And they wanted to provide help information for almost every single field on the form. So they wanted a very neat, compact way to make it possible to show help information. But they also wanted to do it in a way that was convenient for keyboard users as well as mouse users and accessible to screen reader users. So we start off with some basic HTML. And again, this is worst case scenario. We start with a span for what will become the button to show some help information, a div that contains a span that will collectively house the content, the help information to be displayed. Now, I'm not too interested in help information, uh, so this is a, a short and sweet demo. But uh, this is how it will work in practice if you're a mouse user. You can just click on the thing that looks like a button. The help information is revealed. And it's very easy just to click and close the information out of the way once you've read it. But again, 
if we're going to use this with a keyboard, uh, this is what happens. Again, absolutely nothing. And you'll be familiar with this now, because that span, like the link span before it, has no accessibility information, no keyboard focus, and can't be interacted with unless you use a mouse. So we need to start fixing things. Again, we use tab index 0 for exactly the same reason that I said before, because we want to just put this button into the natural tab order of the page. We then add in some focus styles, again, so that keyboard users as well as mouse users know when they focused on that button and they know what they're about to activate. Good usability as much as anything else. And then we get into the mechanics. Again, we use the aria role attribute in different places. This time, our span is going to become a button. So we use a role of button there. And that will translate it into a button in the accessibility tree in the browser. We're going to put a role of complementary on the div that contains the help information, because this is complementary information. And uh, on the span inside the content area, we're going to give it a role of tooltip, because there is a lot of similarity with a tooltip in the way this toggle tip behaves. We're also going to use some other ARIA attributes. ARIA-expanded goes on the button. And it will tell screen reader users whether the help information is expanded, i.e. shown, or collapsed, tucked away behind the button. And when a screen reader user focuses on this button now, they'll hear expanded or collapsed, depending on the state. So it sets up a kind of queue that lets you know what's going to happen when you activate the button. We also add in ARIA described by. And again, this goes on the button. And what ARIA described by does is associate some descriptive information with the button. So it means that as soon as a screen reader user activates this control and the help is displayed on screen, it will also cause their screen reader to read that help information automatically to them. So all they need to do is hit the button, reveal the help, and their screen reader will read the contents out without them needing to do anything else at all. So good usability for screen reader users. Uh, we're going to add in the hidden attribute. Uh, this just plain HTML. There are lots of ways that you can hide content, both visually and from assistive technologies like screen readers. CSS display none would have worked just as well. But HTML hidden does the job, and it's nice just to keep things all in the same uh, language. So for a personal choice as much as anything in this case, I've chosen to use the HTML hidden attribute because it will hide things visually and from screen reader users. The last thing we're going to add in is another ARIA attribute, uh, ARIA-live. And what this does is it turns the element that it's added to into something called a live region. When content is updated in a live region, a screen reader will read the changed content automatically. So it doesn't matter where on the screen the screen reader is focused, anything that gets changed in this live region will get automatically announced. So it's very useful when you have information that does update or get changed at a point somewhere else on the page from where the screen reader is currently focused. So to use this widget, the screen reader has to be focused on the button. And it means that activating that button uh, will just trigger the live region. If any content gets changed in that live region while this is open, the screen reader will also announce those changes automatically without the screen reader user having to go look for them. So again, this is more about usability for assistive technology than pure accessibility. So then we're just going to add in some pretty familiar functionality again. The mouse functionality, we're going to get uh, it to cause the help information to be toggled, displayed, or uh, hidden. We're also going to do the same for keyboard. But this time, we're going to listen out for both uh, key codes 13 and 32. Because if you were to use a button element in HTML, the browser would let you activate it using either the space or the enter keys. So again. In the same way we mimicked that behavior with the link, we're going to do the same now with this button and let people choose to use either space or enter to activate it. 
we're going to add a last little bit of functionality in because although it's easy to close this help information with a mouse, uh, it's got to be easy to do that with a keyboard as well. So if someone has moved away from the button to read through the content of the help information in more detail with a screen reader or just moved with the keyboard to fill in the form for which this is providing help, uh, then all a keyboard user has to do is hit the escape key, no matter where on the page their focus currently is, and it'll close the widget and tuck it back away behind the button. So again, just making things convenient as well as accessible. So lastly, the functionality. If the toggle tip is currently hidden and someone hits the button, we just change the state of the ARIA expanded attribute to true to say it's now expanded. And we just remove the hidden attribute to reveal the content visually and to assistive technologies. And of course, if uh, the toggle tip is not hidden at the time, we do the reverse. And uh, that's basically all the functionality for the widget. <coughs> And so now, for all that code that we've added in, all the things that we've thought about, we have something that will not only work with a mouse, but also with a keyboard and a screen reader. Tab, tequila button collapsed. Enter, expanded, tequila makes me happy. Escape, collapsed. Well, I said help information. It was almost right, but tequila does make me happy, trust me. So that's a good way to just uh, when you're building something from scratch, when there is no existing HTML widget or component that does the job for you, that's uh, how you can use technologies like HTML and ARIA and JavaScript and CSS to come together to build something that's very usable for all your audiences. The last design pattern I want to touch on just very briefly is that of tab panels, because these are used more and more often on the web today as a way of making best use of limited space on a web page. When you have lots of chunks of content that you want to make available, but you don't want to have them on different pages, a set of tab panels is a good way to go about doing it. So we start off with some basic good quality HTML, uh, an unordered list containing some list items that each have links in. And these will form our tabs that people will be able to select to reveal some content on the page. Uh, we're also going to use just plain div elements as the tab panels. And this contains the content that will be shown or hidden, depending on which of the tabs is selected. So it's pretty basic HTML. And with a little bit of scripting and styling, this actually will work pretty well for mouse users, keyboard users, uh, and screen reader users as well. This is what the experience is like for a screen reader user. List of three items. Same page link, Blanco. Same page link, Reposado. Same page link, Joven. Enter, Joven, same page link. List end. Blank. Joven tequila is dot, dot, dot. So in one respect, that's OK. You can tell there's a list of three items, and if you select one, it's a same page link, so you know that it points to content somewhere on the same page. And you can navigate to that content. But being told there's a list of three items and some same page links doesn't really match the way this looks visually on screen. It's also pretty awkward to have to use with a screen reader. You heard all sorts of information there about list end and same page link and a blank for a blank line. And it took a bit of effort and a few key presses to navigate to the content. So we can actually make things a lot better from an accessibility and usability point of view. We can start with some role attributes. And again, the, uh, the role attribute this time is used on the UL element. And we give it a role of tab list. That's because instead of having an unordered list of items, we want to have a tab list which will contain some tabs. And to create those tabs, we put a role equals tab onto each of the links inside the tab list. That then converts these links from being links, as you heard in the demo at the beginning of this talk, to something that a screen reader will report as being a tab. The last thing we do is put a role of presentation on the li element. Starting with this good HTML is a good thing to do because of progressive enhancement. If someone doesn't end up with the functionality, the JavaScript, to put in place all this accessibility, then you want the HTML to be there as a good fallback. 
But if you've got to the point where you've added all the accessibility that we're going to, you don't really need to know about those list items. We've changed the UL into a tab list. We've changed the link into a tab. And so at this point, that list item becomes a little bit redundant. So we just say to the browser and the accessibility tree, make this presentational, kind of just forget it exists in any kind of meaningful terms. The last uh, role we're going to do is put a role on each of the divs that contain the content that will be displayed. And that's a role of tab panel. And this is the third role in the tab list, tab and tab panel set that go together collectively to create a set of tab panels in the way that we are trying to do. We're going to put another ARIA attribute on the links, uh, ARIA-controls. When you have uh, an element that controls another on a page, so in this case, we have a tab that controls a tab panel, when you do something to the tab, like select it, that's really obvious visually that something has changed. But if you're not looking at the page because you use a screen reader, then that's very difficult to find out. So the ARIA controls attribute says, this control that you're on, this tab that you're on, controls this particular tab panel. And in the case of one screen reader, JAWS, it'll give you a shortcut for moving straight from the control, from the tab, into the tab panel content. So again, a measure of convenience. We are also going to use aria-selected. This can go on all of the tabs, but only the currently selected tab, so the one whose tab panel is visu visible, should have aria-selected set to true. The other should be set to false. And this, again, just tells screen readers what's very obvious visually, that that particular tab and its corresponding tab panel have been selected and are currently visually displayed. So lastly, we're going to use the tab index attributes. Now, links in their native state are, of course, focusable. But what we don't want to do here is make everybody who uses a keyboard have to focus on the first tab in the set and then the second before deciding which one they want to use. And bear in mind, this is a simple example. Most tab panel sets have maybe five or six, seven or eight, maybe more tabs on display. So we want to make choosing, selecting a tab as convenient as possible. And so what we do is only the currently selected tab, the one with aria selected equals true, has a tab index of zero. We make it focusable. All the others have tab index minus one set, and that removes them from the tab index completely or from the keyboard sequence completely. What we then do is use JavaScript to add in the keyboard interaction that makes life a lot easier. So we stop people having to tab through every single tab in the set. And I'm sorry, the language does get really confusing with this. And instead, we make it possible um, for them to use JavaScript. Uh, before we do that, we're just going to add a bit more ARIA in. Uh, we're going, sorry, no, a bit more HTML in. We're going to add in the uh, hidden attribute, again, as we did before with the toggle tip, to hide all but the currently selected tab panel. Uh, and again, that just tucks it out of the way, uh, except for the one that you want to be visible on screen. We're going to add a last little bit of ARIA in the ARIA-labeled-by attribute. And this goes on the div that is the tab panel. And it takes an ID as its value. And the ID belongs to the tab. And what this does is just gives the tab panel uh, an accessible name. So much like the checks box at the start of this talk, uh, these tab panels now will have an accessible name or a label that is the same as the tab you selected to show it. Uh, I mentioned the keyboard interaction. So what we want to do now when somebody tabs onto the set of tabs, we want to give them the opportunity to use the uh, left and right or up and down arrows to cycle through the tabs. And as each tab is focused on using these keys, it's automatically selected and displayed on screen. So we keep the interaction exactly as though you were using a set of tabs in a software application, like an email client or your browser, perhaps, or somewhere else. So it's a very familiar interaction based on the way that this thing looks on screen. And now, 
after all that coding and information. Uh, this is how it works for a screen reader user. Tab, blank a tab selected, use JAWS key plus Alt plus M to move to controlled element, one of three. Reposado tab selected, use JAWS key plus Alt plus M to move to controlled element, two of three. Joven tab selected, use JAWS key plus Alt plus M to move to controlled element, three of three. Move to controlled element, tab panel. Joven tequila is dot dot dot. Tab panel end. So now, although it looked exactly the same on screen, for a screen reader user, there was a lot of very different information available. We knew al almost immediately that it was a set of tabs, that uh, the first one that we selected was one of three, so we knew how many tabs there were in this particular set. We were told that uh, each tab, as we moved to it, was selected. And in this case, because this demo was recorded with the JAWS screen reader, we got the shortcut key that told us how to move straight into the tab panel content. When we did that, we got told that we were moving to that content, and that was then announced as a tab panel. It was read automatically, and we were told when the tab panel ended. So a lot more information that's much more true to the way a set of tab panels looks on screen. And that's often the value of good accessibility, especially when it comes to using ARIA, is that often what you're trying to do is provide equivalent information that's already available to other people um, because they can look at a design pattern on screen, look at a set of controls, and immediately know what it is, how to use it, and how to interact with it. And using ARIA, we can make that same information available to someone who can't see those visual cues. So a quick and dirty top tip list of accessibility mechanics. If you can, use the right HTML for the job. Be lazy about accessibility. Don't do any more work than you have to. We're busy enough as developers as it is. So if you can use HTML, let the browser do more of the hard work, and you get to do less of it. If you can't do that, then think about keyboard focus and interaction. If you're building something, go home this afternoon, get to work tomorrow, unplug your mouse, and try using what you're building with a keyboard. See if you can do it. If you can't, then you know you've got something to go ahead and fix. And you'll be doing a lot of good things for a lot of good people if you do. Think about uh, roles and names and state and all the information we've looked at today that's absolutely invaluable to screen reader users and other assistive technology users. If you're not using native HTML, think about using role and other ARIA attributes to make that information about what something is, what state it's in, and how to interact with it available. And if you can start doing those, you really will be making quite an extraordinary difference to an awful lot of people. Grazie.